Are you ready, church? Excited? All right, all right. So I'm going to have you stand back up. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It's going to be on the screen next to me, but let's just all read that out together. Here we go. Ready? If I speak human or angelic languages, but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you so much. You can be seated. We are starting a new teaching series today. We're looking at upgrading relationships. Every one of us could have a, a relationship that could be upgraded. And we're diving into this scripture today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In fact, we're going to be diving into it over the next several weeks. And the word upgrade, what it means is taking something and adding something to it and then upgrading it, of improving it to some sort. You know, that reminds me, right, of, of going to a drive through and you pull it up and the, you make an order and you, you're like, I want a burger. And they, they say, would you like to upgrade it? And what they're asking is, you know, that thousand calorie burger, would you like to make it 5,000 calories? <laughs> and you're like, of course. Like, what kind of question is that? Of course I do. Add the double cheese. Let's throw a milkshake on it. I mean, yeah, you got to you got to run 50 miles later, but it doesn't matter. Just add that on too. But what happens is, is we take that mindset and it becomes this mantra. And, it, and we do it in Lexington. We do it in really all of America. And the mantra is bigger, better, faster. Bigger, better, faster. We got to go faster. We got to be bigger. We got to be stronger. We got to upgrade everything in our life. And we do that all the time, right? We, <clears throat> we do that as parents. I mean, we say, you know what, kid? In order for you to do really well in the SATs, you're going to start in fifth grade studying for the SATs. I mean, I didn't wait till my like senior year, the last two weeks of school to study for the SATs. But now they start. True story. I've heard of people starting their kids when they're in sixth grade. That, that's why we have four-year-olds playing t-ball. Four-year-olds. I've coached four-year-olds playing t-ball. There's gray hair here. That's why. That's also why we love technology. We love technology. We want self-driving cars. We want self-driving lives. We want self-driving everything so that we can do more, bigger, better, faster. But what the problem is with all of it, there's nothing wrong with some of that, but what the problem is that it, it kind of seeps into the very thing that is the most important thing, and that's our relationships. That's why we have these marriages that are just getting by. That, that's why we have these families that are just reeling. That's why we have this loneliness that is dripping in our culture today like never before. That is why, friend, we have these souls so often that are parched and cracked. and They're like a desert ground. They just desperately need water. And so we bring all that and we think better, bigger, better, faster. That's the answer. Bigger, better, faster. That's the answer. And what happens is that we just end up dry and our relationships end up suffering. So a couple years ago, I was right at this place and I had a friend of mine come up to me and ask me this question. Ray, how's your, how's your, how's your marriage? How your, how's your relationship with your kids? How's your relationship with your coworkers? 
And honestly, a moment of authenticity, I said, man, just, it's just not so good. And then he asked me a question that I just thought was remarkable. He said this, what do you want to be known for? That's a great question. So if you were to write this down, if you were to process this and answer it for me, what do you want to be known for? What would you write down? Maybe you would be like, well, I want to be a better person, or I, I want to be a better husband, a better wife, better parent. I want to be a better coworker. I want to be a great student, or I want to have great doctrine. I want to have great theology, or I want to be a godly person, or I want to do this, or I want to be this, or whatever the case. I want to be successful. No doubt. Oh, those are great, I would say. But I guarantee that none of you, you know, if you were taking notes, you wrote down, I want to be a jerk. That's my, what I'm in and out for. <laughs> or, or you wrote down, man, I want to be the most uh, um, impatient, um, um, pain in the side person my wife, my husband has ever met. Like nobody ever wrote that down, right? But how, why is it that your pastor, this guy right here, so often embodies that as opposed to the, the other characters that I talked about? Why? Well, it's this one particular word that, that, that Paul talked about. He mentioned multiple times in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the one word that God says, this is your will. This is my will for you in your life. And the very one word that we should all be known for, regardless of who we are, is this specific word. L-O-V-B-E. What does it say, everybody together? <gasps> Love. Yeah. There was this, this song that came out a long time ago, and it asked the question, what is this thing called love? And Nat King Cole, one of my favorite artists, sang that song. What is this thing called love? And the reason why that song was so popular for over 50 years was because it was asking a question of its culture that mo many people are asking, what is love? And then there was another song in the 80s and 90s, that, you know, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, right? Like that was another one. Paul uses this word over and over and over again. So what is this love? Because we love burgers and we love BBN and, and we love horses. Is it the same thing? Well, Paul uses a word that actually in the Greek language, it's not the word eros, which comes from our word for sexual feeling and um, actually where we get our word erotic. That's not the word he uses. That's a feeling. Another word he, that he doesn't use is the word phileo. The word he does use in the Greek is the word agape. He says over and over again when he uses the word love, he's using the word agape. And the word agape, what it means is I'm going to give to you and I expect nothing in return. That I'm going to be unconditional with no conditions put on it. I am concerned about your welfare and not my own. And the, 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 the area that we see agape the most 100% of the time is that of Almighty God. Because he is an agape God. And Jesus kind of gives this hint to us in Matthew chapter 22. He says, listen, if you're going to really get this life, you need to first love God, agape love, or agape God. And then God gives you the agape for your neighbor. And then in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7, he says, you know, seek the welfare of the city. Agape, that's it over and over again. See, and throughout the Bible, if you look at the pages of Scripture and read through it, what you find is God overwhelmingly saying, if you want to know what love looks like, it's, you know, who are the oppressed? Lift those up. Protect those that don't have a voice. Lift up those who need it the most. That is what we are to be known for. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, he writes a letter. We call it 1 Corinthians. And he's on a mission trip and he's in Ephesus, a different town. And somebody tells Paul, hey, there's trouble in Sea Town. The church that you planted has some major issues. And the guy tells them all these issues. And Paul goes, under the Holy, uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he shares this letter to the church and then they would read this letter. Now, here's what you got to understand about Corinth. Corinth was a town that was moving. I mean, it had like a downtown square like New York City. There was billboards everywhere. It was a town of commerce. It was a town of education. I mean, it was a lot like Lexington. You know, Lexington is one of the most educated cities in the country. This was Corinth. They, they knew and they pursued bigger, better, faster all day long. But the problem was it had seeped into the church and the church started looking a lot more like the culture 
than distinct and being different. And so Paul writes this letter to, first, to the Corinthians church, and we call it 1 Corinthians. And he says in the first part of 1 Corinthians, he says, listen, I want you to stop suing each other. That doesn't look like Jesus. And then later on, he addresses something else. He's like, stop sleeping with your mother-in-laws. That's messed up. And then later on, they're getting drunk during communion because they aren't drinking grape juice, okay? And, and he says, stop doing that as well. But then he rounds the corner into ver- chapters 11 and 12 and 13 where we find ourselves and there's this overarching theme we see. He says, listen, this bigger, better, faster thing that seeped into the church. He says, you've got it in your head that it's all about possessing, 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 faster, bigger, better. But in reality, you've really lost track of the purpose that God has made you for. So if you want to know context, chapter 12 and 13, if you want to know the bigger picture, what Paul is saying here, we see this emerge, this, this, this theme. And the theme that we see emerge is this, everything without love is nothing. You can have everything, bigger, better, faster, the Lexingtonian way, the American way. I mean, really what we think about every single day, we can have everything, but without love, friend. It's like we have nothing at all. Now, evidently, in chapter 12, Paul, he's writing them, and he he starts to point the finger right there to the church. See, inevitably, what had happened was that they had begun to follow Jesus Christ. And what happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus is he radically saves you. And it's amazing, and you're forgiven, and you're declared righteous because of what he did upon the cross for you, and then three days later he rises from the grave. It's the most beautiful, life-changing message that the world has ever heard and will ever hear. And then the Spirit of God gives you a gift, and you're able you're to take that gift and to use that gift with the body of Christ so that the body of Christ is lifted up. But what had happened in the Corinthian churches, because they're all jacked up, they say, you know what? This spiritual gift is better than this spiritual gift, which is funny because they didn't actually generate these gifts. God gave them these gifts. So they said, well, here's the gift of knowledge. Here's the gift of prophecy. But the, bit, the greatest gift is the gift of tongues, the, <clears throat> actually the gift of languages. And Paul says, look, all these gifts are valued, but you're missing the point. He said it's spiritual fruit that is to be truly, truly accounted for and pursued. In fact, he says in chapter 12, verse 31, he says, there is even a better way. And then he gives the better way in chapter 13. And so under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Paul, he, he sits down and he begins to write chapter 13, maybe the greatest chapter Paul ever writes, like, like a breath of fresh air that we need to breathe, honestly, in our culture today, over and over and over again. And so he begins this, and the first thing he does in, in verses 1 through 3, if you're taking notes, he really, in your notes it says the problem, you can write next to it, separation. He, he helps them understand that there had been this separation. There had been separation from all that they were going after and this thing called agape, this thing called love. He starts out and he says three times, he uses this phrase, do not have love. In verses 1, in, in verses 2, in verses 3, do not have love, then you have nothing. And, and, and Paul is telling the Corinthians, listen, friends, if you're going to, do this, I want you to know you don't really have anything at all. He's trying to pour into them and help them take note of. He's like, listen, you've accomplished, you've acquired, you've gone after all these things, and yet, friends, you're left holding the bag and there's nothing in it. And then he gives examples of this in these three verses. He says, first of all, like, man, you know, we'll put them on the screen for you. The first one is you can have angelic languages. You can talk the best you've ever, you know, talked. You can sound like Morgan Freeman and Winston Churchill put together. But if you don't have love, Corinthians, you've got nothing. I mean, think about it. I, I, at my eulogy, in my will, Morgan Freeman will, you, will read my eulogy. It'll be awesome. But, but Paul says that even if you have the most eloquent of speech, then without love you have nothing. And then he continues, he says, if you have the gift of prophecy, meaning that if you have God's truth for someone else, which is an incredible gift, But yet if it's all for you, Corinthians, if it's all for what your gain is and you don't have love, well, then really you have nothing at all. 
You know, I think about an incredible example of what it means to have the gift of prophecy and also the, the gift of love and it combined and not separated is Jeremiah. If you read the book of Jeremiah, what you gain from Jeremiah is that Jeremiah is this prophet that God gives this message to these people and really they don't want to hear what he has to say and yet he says it over and over again and he cries. He's tear, he tears up. Why? Because his heart is broken for them. But yet Paul says, man, if you separate it, if you've got this unbelievable gift of truth, but yet you don't have the gift of, you don't put it together with love, then you have nothing. Then he gives you another example. He says, if you have knowledge, Corinth, I know you're educated. I know that you have degrees upon degrees upon degrees. I know that you know theology. I know that you have doctrine that is very solid. I know you have all things, things. But if you don't have love, I mean, you're suing each other. If you don't have love, I mean, you, you're not even loving your spouse. You're sleeping with your mother-in-law. I mean, you, you have nothing, right? You know, if, if you look back over the, the last couple hundred, some of you are joking about that last thing I just said. But if you, if you look back over the last several hundred years, maybe even the last 2,000 years in church history, here's what you'll find. For the most part, the church has always had a pretty good doctrinal foundation. Now, there's been errors and times when we needed to self-correct. But for the most part, the Church of Jesus Christ has always had solid doctrine. Do you know what it's not been a characteristic of the church of throughout this whole time? Love. And so I think a lot of times we think, well, I just get my knowledge right. I'll get my doctrine right. But Paul says, if you don't have love, friend, well, then you have, you have nothing. But then finally, he says, man, you can give and you can give and you can give, Corinthians. But if you don't give with love, then you have nothing. He says, listen, when was the last time that you loved to give? Corinthians, like when was the last time that you smiled as you tithed to the church? He said, you have nothing. And so what he, he does is this is the problem that you've separated from it. But then he, in the next few verses, he gives the solution. In your notes, next to the solution, you can write alignment. Alignment. See, the solution, number one, is when my words align with love. The solution is when my words, when they align with love. Do you ever remember growing up and you did something wrong and you did something to somebody else and then somebody made you apologize and you didn't mean it? Do you remember that? I remember that. One time I had this idea to take super glue in my brother's fingers and super glue his fingers together. It was awesome. And uh, my mom said, you, you need to tell your brother sorry. And so he's crying. And, you know, we had to, like, cut his fingers apart to get him, you know. And, 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 and I thought it was awesome and hilarious. And, and she goes, apologize. And so literally this is how I did it. I'm oh, sorry. Can I go play now? No, you need to say you're sorry and mean it. I'm sorry. You're right. Well, you know, fast forward in life, now I'm married and I have a, a beautiful wife and I say something to her that, that was hurtful to her and she says, Ray, that really hurts. And so I have that, that, that same posture at times. I'm sorry, can I go play? No, you didn't feel, I didn't feel your love, Ray. When my words align with love, then that's the solution. Paul says in, in the next few verses, he says, love is not conceited. See, the idea here is, is that I'm not vaunting myself above someone else. That I'm seeing the world not through my eyes any longer, but through their eyes. The idea here is that it really is about if I've hurt someone, then my words and my actions need to be aligned. Love needs to be the course. Three hardest things to say, no doubt. I'm sorry, I was wrong, and Worcestershire sauce. No doubt, right? An apology that doesn't say, I love you, is, I'm sorry if you were offended. I'm sorry if, roll your eyes, right? An apology that says and aligns with love is, I was wrong for this. Will you forgive me? We talked about that a few weeks ago. This is when our words align with love, right? But then the second solution is number two, is that when my beliefs, when my doctrines align with love. Here's why I say that. Because those closest to you in your life have a front row seat to your faith, don't they? You can act a certain way on Sunday. You can even act a certain way to a certain extent with some of your friends. But those who live with you, those who maybe even work with you, they have an up 
front seat to really who you truly are. And they're going to be able to know if your orthodoxy is aligned with your orthopraxy. So often the case, we don't really practice this. The people that maybe know it the best are your kids. Man, they're watching, aren't they? They are watching and they're learning. You know, I, one of the things about me is that I'm not a very patient person. Anybody in this room not a patient person? I've always struggled with that. But there's one thing that I'm patient with, and that is waiting for ice cream. I mean, I'll wait for a long time for ice cream. Why? Because it's so good. But one of the things that really gets to bothering me, waiting in line for ice cream, are the samples that people get. I mean, it used to be, right, that one sample was okay. But now, if you, I think it's like 8, 9, 10, 15, 20, 25 samples people are getting. I stood behind somebody, no joke, and they, they had like 30-something samples, and then they went and got a kid's cone that was vanilla ice cream. So I'm standing there in line with my two girls, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. I'm start, you know, slowly the impatience is building into my life. And then my girls get up there, and they, I'm, you can have whatever you want. Daddy's taking you out. And, and, and they go, can I have a sample? I'm like, oh, no. They're, they're modeling what they just saw. And so the impatience is building and building. Ten minutes later, they finally choose they want vanilla <laughs> that they were starting to go with. And so I'm full of impatience, and what happens next is I, I smile but through my teeth, I say something else because people are watching, right? But my doctrine, my beliefs would be that we have a God who's long-suffering. But yet my life, my orthopraxy is completely misaligned. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul, he talks about that. He says, love it's patient. It's like our God. Of, he's long-suffering. And this word patient, you know what it means? It means to literally walk beside somebody in every single season with this amount of long-suffering. It means that, look, I'm going to be patient with you. And you may not be up. You may be down. You may be this. You may be that. But I'm going to walk alongside of you because that is what love and agape is. So let's get practical for a moment real quickly. Let's just take baby steps towards practicality in your life, aligning your beliefs and your doctrines with love today. Is there someone in your life that is hurting? Is there somebody in your life that truly is down? I would imagine that somebody is a, a, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, a, a sibling, a roommate, whoever it is, a coworker. Is there someone in your life that is truly down? You know, in my life, um, last week, maybe some of you heard that my dad is very ill, and he is. I had to drive all the way back to Ohio and, and go be with him because he almost died. And we don't know exactly what he has, but the doctors and the nurses, they really believe that it's some kind of advanced cancer. And so we're, we're undergoing tests the next few weeks, and we should know more. And we don't really know what the future lies. It doesn't look good, but we're trusting in God all along. But God has put my dad in my life in this moment, and he's hurting. And I'm asking God right now, Lord, would you give me patience as I walk through it with him? So let's get practical for a moment. What does that look like in your life for you to have agape kind of love for you, for someone else who is hurtful? Well, low-hanging fruit would be, if someone is hurting in your life, what would be like low-hanging fruit? Anybody? It would probably be a, a text, right? Hey, I heard about so-and-so. I'm sorry. I, I got a lot of those last week, and I appreciated every single one of them. That's low-hanging fruit. Another one would be like, well, to pray for them, right? They need prayer. They need encouragement. I got a lot of that as well. But what would be the next thing? And I'm not saying this because I didn't get this. I'm just saying this because this is the case. I believe that long-suffering is best when done in person or up close. The writer of Hebrews, what did he say? He said, let's not forsake basically meeting together doing things face to face. Long suffering is picking the phone up, not just texting, not just praying, but I would say calling. I would say getting together with someone, walking alongside of someone. We live in a social media culture, don't we? Everything's on social media. And let me tell you something, and I've done this as much as you have. Have you ever had on someone's on social media just kind of annoy you? Maybe their political beliefs or maybe they say something that really gets under your, uh, on your nerves. Or maybe they just post a 10th cat video on their wall. And you're like, I just can't take it anymore. And you unfriend them. It's so easy to do, isn't it, right? Just cut them out and you don't have to see it anymore. Well, this is the opposite of a God pay love, isn't it? No, what Paul is saying 
I said, when you, when you modeled the love of Christ, you will walk beside them, that you will practice the presence that God has for you for them. And friend, let me tell you, tell you something right now. This is when our beliefs and our doctrine align, and this is when we look like Jesus Christ more and more and more. So I, I would say this, a couple of different takeaways. Number one, thumb to thumb is good, right? Present when you're texting somebody, but face to face is better. If you're married, I would recommend belly button to belly button. That may be the best thing to do. You'll get it later, all right? But that's only for people that are married. But the point is, is that we, now you're getting it. That's good. But relationships, right? We want these. We want our relationships to truly look like this. And the only way we're going to look like this, and the only way we're going to be a movement in central Kentucky, is if we really put focus on it. That's why David Howard shifted from where he was to a position where he's now he's running point on marriage and, and missions. That's why we started Reengage. It's a big endeavor. Did you know that we have 170 people signed up for Reengage starting tonight? It's awesome. And I can't wait. Why? Because you've got all of these people that are young and old. They're saying, listen, our marriage isn't perfect and we want to crush it. We want our marriage to be a 10. And I don't know where they are coming into it, but I know they're going to walk away with their marriage even more on fire. And so for that to happen, we, we cre- there were some holes on the team. And because of that, in October, November of last year, we said we need to do a search and find someone to kind of step into the, very, the hole that David created when he kind of shifted a little bit. So we, we, we looked at an executive pastor of ministry's role. We put a job description together. We put it on our website. We, told, we, told, we shared about it. And then we started collecting stories and resumes from around the country. We collected 250 resumes, and we processed and prayed through them and narrowed them all the way down from 90 to 50 to 30 to 20 to 15 with a group of people. And finally, God just put our heart on one guy and we begin to talk to that one person and pray through that with that one person and pray through it with their wife. And then we, they came into town and met with 50 plus different other people. And I got feedback from all those 50 plus other people. And they were like, we love this person. So I'm excited to announce that we found an executive pastor of ministries here at Emmanuel and his name is Brad Thomas. And uh, I think we have a picture of him. There he is with his wife, Lainey, and his two kids. They're both in college. And I love him because of this reason. He loves Jesus. He loves people. He has a breadth of experience, many, many, many years in, in, in ministry. And he is kind of is, is, is of that age where he can relate to someone older and younger alike. And I believe that his experience working in churches that are bigger and smaller than ours will do incredibly well for the future. So we're excited. Their first weekend will be the very beginning of March, and he will be with us. So I pray that you'll look forward to him being there. But I'm excited that we can make these changes so that we can pursue and equip relationships to win, right? But then finally, finally, when we are hurt by someone, which is going to happen. The person that has hurt us, regardless of whether they know it or not, has a front row seat to our orthodoxy and our beliefs and how we respond. I, I saw this in my kids just the other day. One of, the, one of my girls hurt the other one of my girls. And I saw it happen. The one lashed out and was mean to the other. And what happened is the other one, she, it's like she, she was like a pillow. And she absorbed the blow, forgave her, and then just hugged the other person. I was like, that's it. That's exactly what Paul's talking about when he says in verse 4. Love is kind. This word kind, it comes from this very unique word. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And it means to absorb a blow, forgive, and then to love back. Now, I'm not saying that you're to just love someone who's abused you. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking about everyday practical life. Like when you've been hurt, when you've been you know, inflicted with pain, to absorb the blow and then forgive them and then graciously love back online, graciously love back in person, graciously love across the cubicle, graciously love across the kitchen back and forgive and absorb like a pillow. Why? Because it's a lot like Jesus. Absorbing our sin, forgiving us, going to the grave three days later, rising again and living to love. 
And that's what our prayer would be for all of us in this room. And so the question we begin with is, what do you want to be known for? Well, the answer is love. But man, we, we, it's hard to be patient. It's hard to be kind. It's hard to do all these things. Or otherwise, we would have been crushing it already. But what I want to declare to you today, that if we want our life to be of love, well then, friend, what I would really encourage you to do is put your eyes and trust on God. If this is you, and this is someone else, as you pursue God, and you put your eyes on Him, the author, perfecter of your faith, and they do the same exact thing, the distance between the two of you will go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you will arrive at the very thing that God has for your life, for the gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you absorbed our sin. That you took on everything for us. And because of love, you went to the cross and you demonstrated it. But God, you didn't leave us alone. You rose three days later and then you sent your spirit, the helper, the Holy Spirit, to put power into our life so that we can truly see relationships model you. But God, we must admit in this place, in this time, in these moments, that we can't do it alone. And so now, God, if there's anyone who's never first started with you, I pray that they would begin there. They would surrender their life to you. they put their eyes on you. They would trust you as their personal Lord and Savior. Knowing they can't do it on their own, and they would say, God, save me. Redeem my life, and now, God, help me to love those around me. And as we set our eyes upon you and draw closer to you, you then draw us closer to others. So God, now we pray for agape love. And in this moment, now I'm just going to give you a moment. Would you just pray in your heart of hearts? Asking God, drawing closer to him and asking him for strength. God, I pray for marriages. I pray for families. I pray for co-working relationships. I pray for students. And I pray that right now we wouldn't settle for anything but your best for our lives because of what Jesus did for us. In your name we pray, amen.